So uh, I'm Pradral Shastri, an astrophysicist from Bengaluru, and I'm helping Aniket uh, with this uh, series of panel discussions. I would like to welcome everyone to the fourth panel discussion in the series, which is called Invisible Hurdles, Social Justice, and Indian Academia. And this session is called The Pigeonholes of Religion. Uh, first of all, uh, we want to thank Manoj Purankara for offering his uh, Zoom connection for this panel discussion, uh, as also for the previous one. Uh, so to briefly introduce our panelists of today, uh, Professor Jacinta D'Souza is a ciliary biologist and is currently a professor and chairperson of the School of Biological Sciences in the Center for Excellence in Basic Sciences in Mumbai University. And she worked at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research for over 20 years before that. Wasi Haider is a nuclear physicist. Among other things, he was a Royal Society postdoctoral fellow at Oxford and an SERC UK fellow and was professor of physics at Aligarh Muslim University for 40 years. In engaging uh, with his students beyond the classroom, uh, he's known to go beyond the confines of physics into issues of poverty, equality, and social justice. He's also a science writer, especially in Urdu. Meera Nanda is an interdisciplinary scholar, a historian of science. She has a double PhD uh, in biotechnology from IIT Delhi and in science studies from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, USA. She was a John Templeton Foundation Fellow in Religion and Science and taught history of science at both Aysar Mohali and Aysar Pune. She's worked, among other things, on the intersection of the history of science and Hinduism in India and challenged both the relativization of science and the mythification of science. T.V. Rajman is a physicist who studies the behavior of light on tiny nanometer scales. He got his master's from IIT Kanpur and PhD from EPFL Switzerland, and is now a postdoctoral researcher at Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. He is a passionate science communicator and is also passionate about countering pseudoscience. Our moderator for today is Shomitra Banerjee, uh, who trained as an electrical engineer and has researched nonlinear dynamic systems for several decades. He served in the faculty of IIT Kharagpur for 23 years and then of ISAR Kolkata. He's the general secretary of the Breakthrough Science Society, which has played a leading role in India March for Science. I will uh, now hand over the floor to Shomitra Banerjee. Thank you, Pradeva. Uh, the way I understand it, the way the whole thing uh, started, the seed was the event that happened in the US where a black man was murdered in broad daylight by policemen. And that created a furor. And a, a great movement was unleashed in the US. But that led us, people in the other countries, to introspect on various things. Basically, the, the, the thing that, has, that it has brought to the fore is essentially that certain sections of the society are not given a level playing field. If you have heard, I heard on, the, on somebody's forward in uh, Facebook, uh, some uh, leader of the, the black rights movement in the US saying that for a long time, you had your knees on our neck. So we could not flourish, we could not do what we could do just because you had your knee on our neck. The question then is that in our country, do we have a similar situation for a section of the people? Uh, is it true that the section has somebody else's knee on their neck so that they cannot flourish? And our focus today is on academia. Is it true that some people are uh, discriminated because of the religious background. Today's the focus is on religion because of the uh, religious background. These are the issues that we will deal with. But whenever there is a question of religion, inevitably the question of secularism comes because it is the antithesis of religion. Secularism is something that is brought, that, that is integrated into our constitution. And uh, so we need to understand what exactly does it mean? Is it that uh, non-secularism means uh, 
patronage for a particular religion? And is it that the secularism means patronage for all religions? Or is it that uh, an idea where there is non-recognition of any supernatural entity? Is it that uh, religion is considered to be a person's private affair and it has no role to play in the state affair? So these are the issues that, that we need to also deal with today when we deal with religion and its effect on academia. Effectively, we would like to hear from the panelists what their understanding is regarding the discrimination that a section of the society faces depending on their religious background. So with that brief introduction, I would now request Professor Jacinta D'Souza her introduction you have already heard only, so I'm not repeat that. Uh, let me request Professor Jacinta D'Souza to start. I'll request all the panelists to start to, to speak for about 10 minutes, and then we'll take questions from the audience and the discussion will continue. Professor uh, D'Souza, please. Thank you, Prajwal and uh, Samitra, and thanks to the organizers for giving me this invitation. I hope I'm audible to everybody. Good evening to one and all. Um, okay, at the outset, I must confess, um, well, I'm not in the confessional box as uh, typically seen in uh, several Christian churches, nor am I starting this session with the sign of the cross. Okay, if that is enough for my secularism, I'll go forward and I'll share some thoughts that I have in my mind. I have two points written down. Um, some I'll read, some of course I have them in my mind. Uh, we all know that uh, since time immemorial, we've been uh, taught about religion, that religion teaches us everything, religion gives us dignity, God enlightens us, religion tells us what is right from wrong, it elevates <coughs> suffering, it is a reward based uh, concept, and so on and so forth. Um, I will share some of my personal views, particularly first to whether I believe in religion, um, second, uh, if I do believe, uh, and in particular Christianity, does it come in the teaching uh, that I, you know, uh, I have undertaken at, uh, at CBS? So, um, you know, while we talk about religion, we also have been slowly hearing that science has slowly replaced religion. So all those in science will agree this, uh, with me. And uh, it has replaced religion because of its, uh, you know, credible and logical way of thinking, of learning about this big mysterious world. So this translates to the fact that few scientists and academicians probably don't believe in God. And that may be a huge fraction. First of all, is that true? I would like to dissect that. Further on, go on with my own views. Uh, let's look at another fact, you know, before I actually uh, talk more of religion, there is another fact that glaringly stares back at us. And uh, that is for centuries, human beings have tried to inculcate uh, you know, their religious precepts consciously or maybe unconsciously as a sacred phenomenon. And I would do that with my child you know, your parents have done it for you and we insist on keeping this as a must inheritance. Almost akin to how rightfully we inherit our parents' genes. So with the leading project of scientific revolution, um, how did we come to live on this earth and can we give humankind eternal life? Um, what do I think? I'd like to start with a thought from Yuval Noah Harari's book, the Homo sapiens. According to him, we have used our jumbo brains quite articulately. He says, we have juggled between reality and fiction to make our lives as comfortable as possible on this earth. One such fiction, according to him, has enabled us not merely to imagine things, but to do so very collectively, which means we gather numbers, we gather a crowd. And we have viewed common myths, creative stories together so as to give this unprecedented ability to cooperate flexibly in large numbers. Those who oppose this cooperation 
did not belong to us. And I think, therefore, that pigeonholing as you and us began since Homo sapiens existed on this earth. We all are so very spontaneous about it. I doubt if we even have a gene for it in our genome. That's number one. And I think from there, secular versus non-secular. Again, pigeonholing. Then with time, our population grew, diseases spread, problems increased, probably happiness decreased. So drawing upon a higher power was and is an option that became very easily available to us human beings. And surely as Indians, we are no less. In fact, we are trained, maybe via rituals, to seek that higher power called God. And that is from our birth. Why not? Even as a Christian, this ritual is more or less a weekly occupation for me as an observance for the Sabbath day. Whether you have a hurdle or a problem or I seek rewards, seeking God became a very weekly affair for me, whether it was linked with problem or not. But during childhood, this was more like a God-fearing and a parent-fearing act. I think this is true with most of us. With time, my troubles grew. I got focused as well in parallel. Thankfully, I, I guess I was sure. And it made me comfortable to call myself as God-loving. And uh, I'd like to connect this with secularism. Because God-loving, I feel, makes me more secular. Uh, as even how Hindu, my Hindu brethren, look at, every, look at God in every human being. And I call that being God-loving. That was when I realized that God and religion should not be this purpose-driven movement captivating the minds of many, cultivating somebody as you and us, that increases its membership and relies on large incomes. I don't think I believe in that. But unfortunately, that is what religion is today. This is, that is also when I realized that pigeonholing religion and God as yours and mine became a very dangerous trend among us homo sapiens. In fact, in India, and I must confess this, in this forum, we carry that pigeonhole in our names, don't we? Not just in our first names. I'm sure all of you over here know very well that Jacinta is a Christian. More so in our surnames, isn't it? So I become a double Christian. My name <laughs> and my surname. So does this anthropological way, I have been thinking, does this anthropological way of pigeonholing give us an advantage? Did it give me one? I don't think so. Did it make me proud of my religion? I doubt. Uh, I think it's a very futile and a worthless exercise. Maybe you, you might be wondering, I'm arriving at this conclusion rather fast. And I'm doing so you know, I, I have been reading about scientists more so during the past few days after Aniket spoke to me that uh, and gave me the uh, title of today's discussion. Um, I think, as I said, it's a futile and worthless, worthless exercise, especially if my so-called religion, Christianity, has not even taught me to be a good homo And I do not reckon myself as a human being. What's the use? In fact, uh, Albert Einstein actually called this a childish uh, superstition. Uh, while yes. still he made a comment. And the comment was very interesting. Science without religion is lame. And religion without science is blind. I'll further talk about Einstein a little bit. Despite his categorical uh, rejection of uh, conventional religion, he would at times become very angry with evangelists for his atheism. He would actually take it as an offense as their lack of humility. And he once wrote apparently, the eternal mystery of the world lies in its comprehensibility. And this is interesting. So is religion, according to me, is religion or the belief in God really comprehensible to the human? Look, I'm a biologist. I keep connecting this with creation and I have a few points a little later on that. 
Um, as I said, I'd like to really dissect this idea with the help of some, uh, you know, yester scientists who've done wonderful science, who've been Nobel laureates, and some of their ideas, not just because they were Christians, you know, just because I can reckon a little better with them. Let's start with Charles Darwin. You know Charles Darwin. He was one of the and the most celebrated evolutionary biologists of his time. In fact, he is known to be a very firm Abrahamic God. An Abrahamic God is the one, you know, with a lineage from the prophet Abraham. And uh, I quote one of his sayings, I have never been an atheist in the sense of denying the existence of God. That's interesting. Isaac uh, Newton, on the other hand, was very unconventional. He said he firmly believed in God, but he did not like the rituals used to worship God. Closer home, and I'm sure everybody loved this scientist, the former president of India, the late APJ Abdul Kalam, he said, for great men, religion is a way of making friends. Small people make religion a fighting tool. Isn't this very true in our current times? He admits very boldly his religion was humanity. Of course, I can go on and on, Marie Curie, Rosalind Franklin, but the best of mine and my favorite is Carl Sagan. You must have remembered the TV series. Carl Sagan, the astronomer, said, um, science is not only compatible with spirituality, it is a profound, profound source of spirituality. This connects, with, connects me with Robert Boyle, the founder member of the prestigious Royal Society and his Boyle's Law on Gases, where he said that his one mission in life on Earth, this is so beautiful, his one mission on life on Earth is the study of nature. And apparently that has been a spiritual duty. This is wonderful. And so the challenging question of can you be a good scientist and believing in God is I'm sure not new to all of you. It's not new to me. As I said, I'll come back to creationism. I too, you know, face questions on creationism while teaching evolution to my students of semester one. Imagine just about 17, 18 year old children who come with uh, you know, their own religious beliefs. Some of them Christian, most of them Hindus, some of them Muslims. And here I'm talking about evolution, I'm talking about uh, um, Charles Darwin and you know all that uh, makes the uh, descent of man, the common ancestry coming from apes, giving them evidences on molecular biology, proteins, DNA, RNA, at the end of the day is it futile? Not really. Students come to me asking several questions. But I must confess that I'm not a vague theist, but an observant Roman Catholic. You might call me a cradle Christian. Although I'm not very efficient at compartmentalizing, I actually draw strength from religion and my answer to them is as follows. I have been reading Dr. Kenneth Miller, who's written Finding Darwin's God. It's a wonderful book. He goes to say, and I echo those words with my students, I just want you to know what is evolution, just as I want you to know that something called glycolysis and the Krebs cycles exists. That's it. For me, faith is one thing, what I believe from the heart, and I live by the moral laws. I try to live by the moral laws. And I... And research, science teaching is rational, obviously, logical. Something that comes to my brain. And I conclude, I wish to offer some statistics from Baruch Shalev's uh, 100 Years of Nobel Prize. It's actually a review of the Nobel Awards between 1901 and 2000. That reveals only 10% Nobel laureates are agonists, atheists, and free thinkers. So where does it take me? Do I feel um, less secular in a country which has uh, given me a lot of freedom? I don't think so. I don't feel less secular. Um, I have excellent Hindu friends, great colleagues. Um, we all are a big team. We work together, criticize each other. I think all in good faith. 
and thank you very much. I'm open to questions. Thank you. Yes, uh, we'll take the questions at the end. First, let us uh, all the speakers speak and then we'll take the questions. Okay. Uh, the, the discussion has, uh, in the meantime, veered around the question, is science compatible with religion and other issues which were not initially planned, but it's good that the, the, the scope of the discussion is widening. Yeah, so I would welcome that. Uh, now I'll Professor Vasi Haider, a nuclear theorist and presently a popularizer of science uh, to, to speak on this particular issue. Thank you. Uh, greetings to all my co-panelists, organizers, and all those who are participating in this event. And I must say about uh, Professor Jacinda that whatever she said was poetry to my ears. Thank you very much for such a nice exposition. I would begin by mentioning a recent book by David Rees. It's a 2018 publication. He's a well-known expert on the DNA studies of human mm -hmm. fossils, who we are and where we came from. He was the lead researcher of a project on Indian subcontinent involving more than 100 scientists, including from CCMB Hyderabad. The research paper is best summarized in a book uh, titled Early Indians by Tony Joseph. I quote hey. Studies such as this already started. Professor Haider, you are muted. Uh, Professor Haider, we can't hear you. Ah, now oh. we can. Uh, if you so could repeat I... what you said in the last minute or so, because we lost you there. Okay. Um, I would begin from the beginning, yes. It's about a book uh, that I recently read, David Rees, 2018 publication. He is a um, very well-known expert on DNA studies of human fossils and the title of the book is who we are and where we came from. He was the lead researcher of a project on Indian subcontinent involving more than 100 scientists including from CCMB Hyderabad. This research paper is best summarized in a book is titled Early Indians by Tony Joseph. I quote from the book the genetic composition of Indian population is like a big pizza. The essential base of any pizza, which is 70 to 90 percent, is from the early out of Africa migrants 70,000 years back. The sauce, topping, and other things on pizza are the result of later mixings, which continued up to the last 5,000 years, and which may be different in different regions more in the Northwest and in the Northeast. However, the base is same in all regions. The lesson is that whether you are a Dalit, Adivasi, higher caste, Brahman, South Indian or North Indian, Sayyid or Sheikh, Muslim of any variety, all have the same base. DNA differences amongst us are less than 1%. Religion, caste, race, are recent things in our long history of about 80,000 years. Having said that, we have in our country deliberately stopped a huge genetic pool to participate in the, in the development of nation building through different levels of discrimination. I'm reminded of a map that I saw recently on the internet. It's about um, racial discrimination. And I was really shocked to see that India and Jordan are the are probably Indians and Jordanians are probably the most gracious people in the whole world. To look at various kinds of discrimination, let us look at what 
the data tells besides some of these stories which surface recently. Some of the data reveal a tale of horrendous marginalization. Uh, since I've been working in the university for the last 40 years, so let me first to start from uh, the from the universities. Uh, the, till 2017 data from the UGC website, we have 789 number of universities, colleges 37,000, institutions 11,000, 260 private universities and 47 central universities. Number of students enrolled in the universities in higher education is 2.9 crores, of which 1.6 are boys and 1.3 are girls. So if you look at the difference of the numbers of boys and girls, you know that there is something very grossly wrong, our attitude towards girls. Now let me come to primary schools. Total number of primary schools in India is about 8 lakh. MHRD data says that there are 92,000 single teacher schools in elementary and secondary level. Schools up to class 8 require absolutely no recognition. While if you want to open a shop in a neighborhood in Delhi, you would require some kind of a license. So in these schools that do not require any authority to check what they are going to teach, they, you can open that school. There are a large number of schools in which just the building exists, there are no students. Rural area schools are 8.53 lakhs and urban area school 1.77 lakh. Now, the uh, input that comes to universities passes out from these schools. So let's see the, what, is the, what is the functioning of these. The dropout rate from secondary schools alone in Delhi has increased during the last three years from 12 to 17%. And dropout without completing class 9 to 10 increased during the last three years. MHRD data says that in some of these states, the dropout is alarmingly high. In Bihar, it's 32%. And in 11 states, the dropout rate is more than 20%. In some states, boys study in private schools because they are the darling while the girls study in government schools. And these boys going to private schools because they can't cope with English. So the dropout rate for boys is more than girls in urban areas. Average dropout rate throughout the country is about 17%. However, Anganwadi's uh, midday meal free education has made a little bit of difference. Uh, let me come to religious breakup of enrollment in primary school, the main area of, on which we were asked to talk. The Muslim enrollment in primary school is 14.3%, which is slightly greater than the percentage of their population. So Muslims have realized the importance of education. So they put their children to school. And among different communities, Jans have the highest percentage literate above seven years of age and number of graduates and above. And of course, everybody knows that Kerala has done a tremendous work on literacy. And, and Bihar is the lowest in the literacy rate. According to one estimate, we will become universally literate nation by 2016, not before that. And there is here again a gender disparity. 82% men are literate, while 65% women are literate. And lack of literacy among women would have dramatic effect on family planning and population stabilization. Most of the people 
attribute low literacy due to usefulness of education and availability of schools in vicinity of rural areas. Now let's see what kind of schools we have. 59% of the schools have no drinking water facilities. 89% have no toilets. Six lakh villages, urban slums, habitat, have hardly functioning schools. And budget allocated for education was never more than 4.3% of GDP from 1951 to 2010, despite the Kothari Commission recommendation of 6%. And there are severe caste disparities. Lower caste dropout rate is just phenomenal. And it's reported that the Prime Minister said in the Parliament that only 47 out of 100 children enrolled in class 1 in each class 8. So here the dropout rate is 52%. And there is an estimate that 35 to 60 million children are not enrolled in school. In rural areas, girls drop out early to help their parents in agriculture. Less than 20% girls who engage in agriculture attend school. <clears throat> and let me talk now about the Muslims in higher education. As I mentioned earlier, that dropout rate of Muslims is very high. Only 5% Muslim students in various universities are enrolled. And if you look at the teaching faculty jobs in universities, only 4.9% Muslims are given jobs in the university. Muslims have the lowest rate of enrollment in universities. Only 13.8% Muslim enrolled, which is nearly the same as that of scheduled tribes. 22% backward caste, 18.5% scheduled caste. In proportion to population, Muslims are worse off and almost same and maybe lagging even scheduled caste. The situation has worsened over the last half century. I hope everyone amongst us have seen the such a committee recommendation. Among the Shlul caste and tribes, if you look at the population between age group 20 to 30, three times more graduates are there among Shlul caste and we have, among Muslims, there are only two times more graduate now. So Muslims have, are going to fall, fall far behind Shidu caste and Shidu tribes. Would you like to uh, come to yes. conclusion now? I think I, I need to stop now. No, no, Maybe you, as you a result of questions. Thank you. Thank Professor you. Rader. Yeah. Uh, it was a pleasure to to have a larger campus in which we learned about the the situation in the education sector yeah. and which community is doing. Uh, okay. So that again expands our campus for this discussion. Yes, I apologize for uh, some not... entering into somebody else's area of biology and didn't talk about nuclear physics. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Carry That's on. All right. That's yes. perfectly all right. Uh, so now I'll request Professor Meera Nanda, who is a historian of science, uh, and naturally we have a discussion topic which has something to do with that. Uh, so I will request Professor Meera Nanda to, to speak now. Professor Nanda, you can unmute yourself and speak. Take some time. 
Professor Nanda has taught in ISR Mohali and ISR Pune, and uh, uh, he has been instrumental in, in debunking many myths about the Indian history, and especially where the Indian history is related to mythologies. So we would like to hear from her. But uh, Aniket, can you uh, contact her some way so that she, she knows that she is being called? Okay, if not, then let us go to uh, the fourth speaker. We'll, we'll hear from Professor Nanda later. Uh, Dr. T. V. Raziman, who is now a postdoctoral researcher in nanophotonics in Eindhoven University of Technology. And he is also a science communicator. So let us hear from uh, Dr. Raziman. Dr. Rajiman, can, can you speak? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Banerjee. Can you all hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, hello. Yeah, so I would like to actually uh, continue on what Professor uh, Bari was talking about. That is, uh, where are the Muslims in academia? And where are the other people like uh, Bari? Well, why don't we see them? And I don't just mean religious and practicing Muslims, but those just from a Muslim social background with the label of being a Muslim. So one of the main things I want to say is that we have very few role models to look up to in academia and sort of talk about you know, on our behalf. This might sound a bit contrary to what we have been discussing so far in uh, terms of um, not being pigeonholed into religion, but uh, please hear me out. I, think, I believe it is important. So I come from a family where my parents were the first graduates of their respective families. And even in my generation, most of my cousins are not graduates. And this is when I come from Kerala, where uh, Muslims are socioeconomically way ahead of the rest of India. The thing is, it's hard to get into and navigate academia without the help of someone in your social circle who can guide you. And very few Muslims have that person they can meet at a family function or at the mosque or at the social functions who can help them with that. And even if you go out of the immediate circle, there are very few Muslim academics who capture public imagination, people who you can look up to as uh, role models. So where are they? The first thing is that to some extent they don't really exist. We know from the Sachar report and other statistics that the number of Muslims in higher education institutions in general is very low. So when I was at IIT Kanpur, there were perhaps two, three Muslim professors who you would even meet at the social events. Meanwhile, both when I was at EPFL and now at TU Eindhoven, I have many more Muslim colleagues, even within my subgroup, because these are international uh, uh, campuses and I have uh, people from Egypt and Iran and so on. So this is not just the case with IIT. And what happens is that Muslim causes end up being taken up mostly by non-Muslims. And the only Muslim faces we see in the media are politicians and religious clerics. And this is not a good situation. And the problem is that people think that this lack of representation is entirely the fault of Muslims. When we talk about underrepresentation of Dalits or women or gender and sexual minorities in academia, most folks agree that it is at least partly due to historical and current discrimination and the rest of the society has a role in it. But when it comes to Muslims, people are immediately like, oh, this is the fault of Muslims themselves. They send their children to madrasas and do not care about education. The reality, of course, is quite different. If you look at the Sachar report, for instance, only 4% of Muslim children study in madrasas. So the society has only stereotypes in mind and has largely decided that they have absolutely no blame in the lack of Muslim academics. And the problem that I would like to discuss mainly is that even the academics who do exist are mostly silent. Being a Muslim academic and being vocal comes with a lot of obstacles. The first thing is that you keep getting judged all the time about your religion. So most Muslims in India have a distinctive Muslim name. I don't exactly, but people still guess that I am Muslim from my name. And it does not just stop at this identification, but turns into prejudice and judgment. That everything this person says is part of some sort of uh, Muslim agenda. 
That might sound very ridiculous, but let me tell you my experience. I'm active on this question and answer website called Quora. It is different from typical social media in that it's not meant for socializing, but for sharing knowledge. One of the main things I do there is countering pseudoscience and misinformation. There are all these completely unscientific claims floating around on social media forwards. And even our newspapers add to this paranoia sometimes. So what I do is explain what the science really says and what is wrong with all these claims. And immediately what happens is that people start judging your religion and attacking you about it. They don't even read what you write and evaluate how solid your sources are. Just that he's a Muslim and that's why he's writing this. The reason people share such pseudoscience some of the time is that it gives them a validation for their traditions. So even if you tell them, see, you can follow your harmless religious traditions all you wish. Just don't spread fake scientific claims about it. They still take it as an affront on their religion. And the moment you talk about any social issues whatsoever, even if they are related to science, people will make it a religious thing again. Why are you talking about this? Talk about Muslims and Islam and the Quran instead. They draw you with a long list of things you are supposed to criticize about Islam before talking about anything related to India. And all hell breaks loose if you criticize something that is seen as normal in Indian society or politics or point out in any way which the society is biased against Muslims. Immediately the response is, oh, you don't like India. Why don't you go to Pakistan? Simply regularly writing against religious pseudoscience has resulted in a lot of trolling against me, even going so far as accusing me of waging science jihad on Muslims. So the reason I told you about this experience is that I feel that things like this put Muslim academics in a very difficult position. They either have to talk about a very narrow part of their field, which has no potential to offend religiously in any way, and stay mum on social issues, or they have to be silent altogether. So this makes it impossible to find accomplished Muslims in other fields who can weigh in on social issues. Even outside academia, if you see the fields Muslims have some representation, say films or cricket, Muslim celebrities have mostly learned to shut up. Think about someone like Javed Akhtar. He's a publicly self-proclaimed atheist who just received the Richard Dawkins Award this year. And even he is sometimes called a jihadi on social media for his views on society and politics. So Muslim is a label that just doesn't wash off unless you behave exactly how people want. So what I want to say is that Muslim academics feel that they need to completely downplay the fact that they are Muslim. Kind of hide part of their identity, so to speak, to be able to survive. The next level of this is the people who say that if you are a Muslim, this is not the space for you. But I would like to uh, follow on what Professor D'Souza said earlier, that being religious or having faith is not a barrier and should not be a barrier to being a scientist, being a teacher, being an academic. So, but that's not the way you are treated when you have the label of religious person and still want to talk about uh, such things. They are like, oh, Islam is against science, so you cannot call yourself a scientist if you are Muslim. And you can see similar say, statements about other fields, like Islam is a political religion, so you should not call yourself secular. Or Islam is a misogynistic religion, so you should not talk about women's rights. And all that. So this is highly problematic due to multiple reasons. So first is that religion encompasses a lot of things and different people take whatever parts they like. So there is faith in religion, there is mythology, there are all these rituals and traditions, and there is even language and dressing and culture and food and all that. So if you accept a religious label, that does not mean that you agree with everything in your scriptures or everything that is followed by other members of your religion. By saying that a Muslim has to renounce the very label before they embark on science or social issues. What you are doing is you are putting all Muslims in one mold without considering what religion means to them individually. And also you are forcing Muslim academics into silence again, telling that someone has to sacrifice their core identity before they can start something, you know, working in a field is 
just a way to exclude them from that sphere altogether. And even worse, this makes social reform much harder. You need Muslim academics and scientists to initiate social reform from their community. So there are problems, especially in the Indian context, that we need to sort out. But by trying to stereotype a clash between the academic and Muslim identities, people are making it difficult for Muslim scientists and academics to enter this discussion and uh, start reform from their side. So what I want to say is that it is very important for us to make sure that there is the next uh, generation of Muslim academics who are coming out. And it is important to let Muslim academics be academics while Muslim. So when they're talking about their field, when they're talking about science or history or whatever, treat them as academics and not as Muslims. When a Muslim is talking about the Indian society, treat them as Indians. And when they're talking about Muslim society and its problems, then don't invalidate the rest of their work because of it. Like so, it it is, yeah. so it's very important that we don't silence the Muslims or force them into the shadows because the next generation really needs to see them and be inspired. Thank you and I'm uh, sorry if I took uh, too much of time. It's all right. Okay, so now uh, we have heard regarding the real problems that some Muslim academics face in the academia. And let us now go to uh, Professor Meera Nanda. We missed her when we called her the last time. She was probably out. Uh, she's a historian of science and she has worked on science and religion, issues related to science and religion. And therefore we'd like to hear from her regarding this today's topic. So Professor Meera Nanda. Professor Meera Nanda. Uh, she is yeah. there. She's on. Uh, Can she unmute herself? Uh, she is unmuted. Uh, I'll just uh, message her to speak. Yes. She's saying uh, she can't hear anything. Is she? Oh. She's muted now. Is she? Um, that can, can somebody unmute Yeah, can her? Manoj or Raniket unmute her? <clears throat> I have asked her to unmute. Uh, so she has to. So she has to unmute, is it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'll send it, a request asking her to unmute. Yeah, it, it, it is to the left bottom corner of the screen. I'll I'll just call her. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. No. I know. I know. I know. Mira, please go ahead. Oh, why is she again unmuted? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Hello. Go yeah, ahead, Mira. Go ahead. Professor Nanda, please go ahead. You are again unmuted. You are again muted. Mira is again muted. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Mira. We can hear. No, again muted. Something wrong is happening. She's probably unknowingly touching the mute button. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I'll speaking. just call. Hello, Mira. Or Okay. Uh, yeah, now you're I, fine. Don't okay. touch that mic button now. Just speak. You're, you're fine. You can... uh, uh, sorry, this is the first time I'm using Zoom. So... 
it's not done i i keep pushing the button it doesn't work okay ah no no everyone now press the button you're fine don't 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 push the button now you're fine i can hear you i'm okay hello okay. yes 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 go ahead hello yes okay Okay. Sorry. Yeah. It's sorry. Yeah, please, 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 please. Technical problem. No. Sorry. Um. Yeah. Um. So uh, thanks for inviting me. I want to. I want to. Hello. Yes. Can hear you. Uh, I want to approach. Am I? Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. Yes. Speak. Okay. Okay. Sorry. You are audible. Um. Yeah. Uh, all right. So I want to uh, approach. Um. the issue, the subject of uh, today's talk um religion uh, and, and am i am i audible okay in holes in the academia of uh, scientific temper and and the role of academia or actually the failure of say, in um um it is my experience of indian academia having worked in it for the last actively teaching in icers two icers and uh, before that you know in um, um it in academia having worked two icers and uh, before the ideas uh, you know um, uh, through uh, it is my you meet in a let's say an icer would would say yeah yeah scientific temper we are all we all agree that scientific temper is a good thing and uh, when we march for science we 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 think we are marching to promote scientific temper um my what i want to suggest to you is uh, scientific temper is not not should not be treated as a philosophical abstraction that you can just sort of uh, you know it's become a slogan um, even the right wing is quite happy uh, 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 with the idea of scientific temper they think by promoting vedic sciences they are actually promoting science because they have co-opted modern science into uh, the hindutva project so treating scientific temper is a, just an abstraction making it into a slogan all the uh, constantly pointing to that article 51 yes these are just words uh, the point of it when we march for science uh, when we talk about scientific temper it should it should in my opinion come through through an active engagement with the common sense of our society the metaphysical and uh, assumptions the method of knowing that is part of everyday life of a, of the of the in the ingrained in the minds of people uh, and the in the where is it that most people get their idea about how what is the world made up of how does it work how do we know who is in the position to know the workings of the nature the world that we live in how where do we get these ideas from where do children get these ideas from the the primary socializing agent in india is still religion schools do not do their job so we have to engage with the religious common sense of ordinary people to, but before we get to ordinary people we have to get to the religious common sense of academicians themselves and that to me is the unfinished job unfinished job of of scientific temper in india um which i want to uh, talk about um and i believe this engagement critical engagement with the common sense is needed today more than ever before why because this is this common sense on which hindutva feeds off hindu nationalism is a is 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 nationalizing a hindu common sense and it has co-opted modern science into its hindu common sense and using it in a chauvinistic manner to put down minorities to fly the flag of hindu superiority so there is you know the, the, this engagement critical engagement that i'm talking about is needed today and what is needed is no pussyfooting around you know 
uh, it's not good enough to say, oh, you are pseudoscience. Uh, it, is, it is necessary, but not sufficient. What is needed is to actually show that the certain assumptions in the Hindu worldview have actually been contradicting. They are falsified. They are not based on evidence as we understand evidence scientifically. Um, so the, you know, instead of letting the other side, letting Hindutva uh, fly the banner of science, it is important now for, uh, for, uh, uh, to show that they are uh, bullshitting us. There is no, no warrant, there is no evidential base for claiming, um, uh, uh, I'll give you examples in a, in a minute uh, of what I mean, where Hindu worldview has been uh, actively, actually falsified. Um, but I want to get to a little bit about the academic failures, um, uh, 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 the failures of humanities and social sciences uh, in carrying out uh, uh, this project. Having taught in ICER, um, uh, first in Mohali for about 10 years, 11 years, and one year in Pune, uh, I realized one thing. Uh, and the funny thing was, I was in a very uh, interesting, I was a part of the faculty of HSS, uh, and I started, uh, in fact, I developed from scratch a course in uh, Introduction to History of Science, which was a comparative world history of, uh, of science, engaged with Hindu, uh, 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 you know, traditional Hindu sciences, alongside with the Greek uh, and the European tradition, and uh, looked at the emergence of empirical uh, uh, naturalistic ideas in world science. And um, we looked at where India failed, where Hinduism came in a Hindu worldview of spirituality, a priority of spirit, and mystical ways of knowing prevented, uh, and the institution of caste together prevented the flourishing of a naturalistic worldview. Uh, so that was the course I was teaching, developed, and all the rest of it. One thing I realized that students, first year students in ICER, ICERs, uh, they, they are totally untouched by historical currents. Uh, some of them, they're very bright kids. Some of them become like scientific rationalists, uh, fundamentalists. The science is everything. They, some of them are, have one foot in this, uh, uh, you know, Hindutva. Uh, uh, understanding of science. Um, so, but, but they're open-minded, they are very intelligent, but, and, and some of them in my class, I noticed were excited to look beyond India, to put India in the world, the world context. I had a wonderful experience interacting with these students. My problem is more with the HSS, the humanities and social sciences. I know it for sure. The kind of scientific temple, let's say, um, uh, the Bolkar uh, or the Andhavishwas uh, committees, you know, the rationalists, uh, uh, we, we will not be supported. We will not find adequate support in social science departments because rationalism, the enlightenment style rationalism is considered too positivistic, too Eurocentric, colonizing. That has been the, the main in stream of social sciences have washed their hands of scientific Nehruvian scientific temper, as they mockingly call it. And, um, you know, the whole trend started with Ashish Nandi and his cohort, and it's now the mainstream of American social sciences, which then come back to India as, you know, the mainstream of social sciences, the post-colonial theory. So that has been one big problem, and I have been <laughs> raging against that. Uh, but this other, there, there is a deeper problem in the humanities departments. They have not examined religion as a as an independent factor, independent variable in the evolution of Indian intellectual history. In fact, intellectual history is one form of history which is not taken, not done properly um, at all in India. Uh, uh, the role of Hinduism is, uh, thanks to the Ambedkarites, is now becoming very clear in, um, uh, you know, uh, in, in, the, in, in how caste worked, in how patriarchy worked. Uh, uh, thank, and that, there I thank the Dalits. Our eyes to um, 
the presence of religious uh, fundamentalist ideas in our own thinking. Um, but but there is a serious lack of intellectual history and the role of religion in intellectual. By intellectual history, I mean uh, uh, conceptions of nature, uh, you know, your metaphysics and your epistemology. And the philosophical debates that went on, Hinduism is famous for its uh, six darshans and its, uh, its vigorous philosophical debates. Amartya Sen calls us the argumentative uh, society. Uh, how did they, who, what were the arguments about? And how have they impacted, how they ended up consolidating a Brahminical spiritualist worldview? And how that impacted the evolution of science is not something that has been carefully uh, studied at all. Uh, we haven't gone there. History departments have not done their job. Uh, so that, uh, I'll give you, uh, and finally, I will, I will not take up too much of your time. Uh, I recently, in 2016, wrote a book, uh, you know, um, Science in Saffron, where I took on um, Narendra Modi type uh, arguments about the greatness of Indian science. But uh, what I want to say is even that kind of where I try, you know, the usual that the, these myths, these are demarcated between myths and science. Yeah, that is important. Uh, and do not read, you know, do not retrospectively read all that we have learned through modern science into the ancients. Fair enough. But I think we need to go deeper uh, in the sense of, uh, uh, for I'll give you examples. Um, there are two major streams uh, in the 19th century, which continue in the 20th century, where science was Vedicized, uh, Arya Samaj, uh, and then Vivekanand. Uh, uh, what was the argument for Arya Samaj? The argument was very clear. The Vedas are the infallible, uh, eternal words. Um, uh, uh, which were transmitted by Brahman to certain seers. And the point is the conception of truth is whatever is infallible and eternal. To, to fallibility, fallibility and revisability is considered a mark of unscientificness. That very definition of science that these Vedic proponents start with, that unfalsifiability and eternality unchangeability is a mark of science is has to be challenged secondly uh, the other vivekanand starts with uh, scientific scientizing spiritualism We're starting with the assumption that all is brahman and you can see the how do you know brahman through meditation through yoga yoga uh, he is a patanjali yoga sutra becomes his his methodology for 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 uh, uh, Hindu science, that through your soul you could see the natural reality. Uh, uh, so my point is, our critique of academic academics have a role to play. That these very fundamental understanding of of ontology and epistemology, they have to be uh, named, exposed, and and a counter narrative has to be built up <coughs> and that is a that is a hard long job uh, and i don't think indian academia has laid the groundwork for this kind of an enterprise and that is to me a real real loss i mean 70 years into uh, after independence uh, we have not set an independent autonomous agenda of 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 social sciences uh, of sciences uh, natural uh, and technologies for this country we follow the fashions set abroad and start deconstructing science without without allowing it to to do its historical job of demystification uh, Nanda, would you like to conclude now of thinking about reformation anyway sorry if i'm talking too much I'll, I'll end and I'll wait for questions. Yeah, yeah. questions later on. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much for saying that. Good. Thank so the you. the initial uh, deliberation by the four panelists is now over. Now we'll take questions from the audience. As you have seen, the canvas has expanded. We have examined the role of religion in science in academia. We have also examine the the
problems faced by certain religious communities in academia. And also we have uh, dissected the, the concept of secularism, what it should be and how it is sometimes perceived. Sometimes it is perceived as something that promotes all the, all the religions. It's not quite so. Secularism is a concept that says religion is one's personal affair and there should be nothing to do. It should have nothing to do with the state's affair. Uh, unfortunately, that has not happened. And now we are seeing a situation where the state is actively promoting certain religious dogma. And uh, we need to, as a scientific community, need to oppose that. Also, we have come uh, to the issue that what should we talk about, what we say as the agenda for science. Obviously, the ad main agenda for science is testability, something that has evidence. We'll believe only that which has evidence. And anything that does not have evidence, lacks evidence, any claim that lacks evidence should be shunned. But not only that, often we scientific community understand that, but don't talk. We don't propagate that idea. Now it is a time when we should do that. Now let us, uh, let's go to the questions to the, to the speakers. Uh, Aniket, would you uh, go to the questions and uh, uh, have you noted down the questions and can you uh, uh, read out the questions for the specific speakers? Because in the chat box, I do not see particular questions. And therefore, uh, I guess Aniket would have them. Okay, there is a question I can see, Professor Nanda. Uh, how can we promote accountability of scientific fraternity in promoting scientific temper, not meaning that only scientific fraternity does it, but considering the huge emphasis and funding always pumped to science, it seems to me an obvious question to scientific fraternity. Uh, that's a question to Professor Nanda. Yeah. Would you like to respond, Professor Nanda? Um, I, I think I agree with uh, Professor Banerjee that uh, uh, scientists know that a certain kind of evidential warrant is needed uh, for legitimate beliefs, for, uh, for clear-headed thinking, but we don't engage. Um, uh, I, I, I think I, when I compare the situation, let's say with the US and, and in India, um, one thing that does stick out to me that uh, important scientists you know, working scientists, you know, Daniel Dennett comes to mind, Carl Simon, he wrote his phenomenal books, was a fun, was a practicing astrophysicist. They intervened in public sphere uh, forcefully, uh, eloquently. And, uh, you know, uh, they brought their prestige uh, to back a scientific rationalist thinking. There's so many important E.O. Wilson. I mean, there's so many voices speaking of working scientists speaking out against creationism uh, uh, fully back indian scientists just simply need to engage uh, and not just abstractly but topically using using counter arguments which are backed by and they need to join hands with with philosophers with historians um, to build up a narrative. And I think Breakthrough Society, the book, uh, especially the book on history of science um, that I had the privilege to look at, um, is uh, get going in that direction. But uh, so, yeah, that, that I can only say kind of white thing. And, uh, you know, this kind of world um, is, is needed. And it's high time the scientific community embraced an agenda which is which is meant for India, you know. It's not good enough to do high-tech science. In, you know, we are not even we are, to get in the global rankings, but to engage with the problems at home. And that, you, by Professor that, Nanda. I mean cultural problems as well, religious problems as well. 
So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rasmanda. <clears throat> I can see there is another question uh, from Chandra. Uh, to everyone, that's an interesting thing to do. Uh, when Raziman and Jacinta ma'am, uh, just a minute, the sensor coming is going off, uh, mentioned that there shouldn't be anything wrong with following a certain religious ideology, and at the same time being in scientific academia, will there not be some circumstances where there will be a conflict of opinion, one's own personal biases I, yes, yes. Yeah. Let me finish the question. Uh, considering both ideologies must be allowed, how does one ensure that their opinions and actions are non-conflicting to both the ideologies? Uh, in, in this, he has quoted Shobhaji Sen's example of breaking coconuts. Yes, that's something I missed to mention. Shobhaji Sen has mentioned that we have a custom of various practices in uh, occasions, breaking coconuts, uh, lighting lamps in the conferences, scientific conferences, before building a scientific building, breaking coconuts, bhumi puja. So these are typical Hindu customs uh, practiced in a secular country. And that, that's definitely questionable. Yes, so the question that uh, Chandra has raised is basically to everybody, if anybody likes to Respond to that. Welcome. If I may start. Uh, yeah. Yes. Sure. Yeah, so I again have some uh, personal experience regarding this. So whenever I do science communication online and then things touch upon religion, people ask me often. I mean, aren't you a Muslim? Don't you believe in this? But at the same time, when I am like um, showing up some Islamic pseudo science, people ask me, "Are you an atheist?" So my answer to that is. My faith is my personal thing. Whether I am a believer or an atheist should not matter when we are uh, discussing this. So in the same sense, as long as scientists and academicians keep their faith as their personal matter, it should not matter. So the example given of all these uh, uh, like rituals, that is not a personal matter anymore. So if a scientist wants to break a coconut in their home before coming to the office for uh, their work and then inaugurating something. That is one thing. But when they are in, in the office and having a public ceremony, then it becomes a different thing. So it is not difficult to make a hard barrier like that. But it is just that historically, we are just used to Hindu cultural events everywhere. So when I was at IIT, my graduation actually started with a clear uh, Hindu prayer towards Hindu deities. Now, if you just switch that around and imagine a clear Muslim prayer, a prayer towards Allah in the same event, a lot of people would be shocked. But we are just used to seeing Hindu events in uh, such situations even way before the current government or anything. So we are just used to it. So if we just think about the public sphere, like let's say a Muslim scientist or a Christian scientist would think, they have the natural uh, feeling that yes, my religion is my personal thing and it's not my business to mix it with the university education. So if that way is how people think, then I don't think there is any conflict anymore. Uh, yeah, I see. add to what he said. Yes, sure. Right. Um, for about 40 years, I've taught at Aligarh Muslim University. And I, what um, Raziban said rings a bell in the sense that every formal function starts with the recitation of verses from Holy Quran. So, I mean, if you have been at Aligarh as a student, you would feel very odd if a function starts with no recitation. We get used to these things. And I fully agree with Raziman that these things should not be allowed. But who is going to enforce these? That is uh, a, that's a big question. I would stop with that. Yes. Okay. Uh, I can see one question that has come. 
the percentage of Muslims in academia in the country in general and in prestigious STEM institutions in particular is way too small. Clearly, there is discrimination at work, but how does it work in practice? How obvious or subtle is it? How can we affect changes? So this question is again to anybody who can take it. So somebody like to respond? Um, Miranji, yeah. Can I? Sure, sure. Yes, Stephen. Hello. Yeah, sure. Please come yeah. Um, I want to uh, both these questions. Uh, I want to uh, the, my uh, my observation in teaching in Nicer uh, was the underrepresentation in, in the classroom. Can I, uh, there were, in both in Mohali and um, the numbers were literally uh, you know maybe one or two per class in a class of two hundred plus you know so presentation, but. Uh, on the other hand, once I, I don't didn't find any uh, overt uh, forms of uh, uh, you know um, um, prejudice, uh, even among students uh, or or from the faculty. Uh, but the 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 problem comes in mainstreaming the Hindu story, you know, nationalizing the Hindu story. Uh, that problem is uh, cuts across academia, and that needs to be guarded against uh, uh, and just very quickly if you give, give me a minute um, I, I personally find the, the compartmentalization argument given by Azim and others that it's okay to to break a coconut in private but not okay in public yes <laughs> you got disconnected can't hear you Can't hear you. Okay, uh, let's go to the next question. Uh, no, uh, oh, oh. um, okay. needs to, uh, you know that conflict is there. It's not just public issue. It's also in your head, in your private life. Would you follow the rituals to a lost belief uh, in a creator god uh, or any kind of act? Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, let's go to the next question then. Uh, the question from Anita is, what would be an agenda for scientists in India in the current context? Would any of the speakers like to respond to that question? So if I may uh, answer. Yes. So uh, what I think is that scientists need to be a bit more proactive in terms of guarding science or, you know, protecting science. Yeah. So this is defending the time science. when, yeah, the defending science, yeah, that would be the right word. The thing is, this is a time when a lot of groups have uh, realized that science is something they can piggyback on for their own agenda. So you see every, so one of the questions right now was about uh, uh, new age gurus and cult figures hijacking spirituality. Similarly, they have also hijacked science. They are really using it to promote their uh, religious agendas or their uh, political agendas. So this is something that can be countered by scientists by stressing on what really science is. So we need uh, like famous or good scientists to come forward and relentlessly fight this misinformation. Because uh, if you think about it, the newspapers, they always put forward the most uh, PRP version of these uh, claims. So they, they would also like to point out that, yes, these traditions are scientific or, oh, look at how India used to have aeroplanes some 4,000 years ago and things like that, because those are interesting news stories and stories that people want to read. So unless there is an effort from scientists themselves to relentlessly uh, say, no, this is not what is going on. This is a misrepresentation. This is what science, this is what history really tells us. Then the wrong sort of information is reaching the people. And the people, they do not really know. They believe the newspapers more than uh, 
they, then they even have forgotten their uh, science that they learnt in school and so on. Okay, so uh, Mayang, Mayang yeah, I add also to something. what you said. Yes, yes. Um, Mad. I think he has very nicely summarized, but I would like to still add to it. Yes, sure. Recently, there was this uh, solar eclipse, and of course, there were many programs on the television, main media. However, the common people believe what the what the sadhus say. Um, I live in a colony in New Delhi with a security guard. And during this lockdown period, we became friends. And on that day, I asked him, why haven't you come and taken the cold water bottle and the he and um, other things for you to have, have your lunch? He said, no, sir, we can't eat anything. It's a, it's a solar eclipse day. So, I mean, many a time I feel that, I mean, not only during the last several years, the attack on science have been vociferous, but the defense of science has been very feeble. It seems as if science is almost an orphan. So I, th I think there's a need of this kind of consciousness among scientists that they have a duty to propagate this. They should write more often in the newspapers on science and scientific thinking. Probably it will have a long effect. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, now I can. We have now little time, so we have to uh, go a little faster. Uh, question from Divya to Dr. Razimman and Professor Nanda In anthropology or the social sciences, the positionality of the observer or investigator is considered to be a part of the experiment. The positionality is seen as having an impact on the analysis. So is it practical to expect that the personal biases of the individual can be completely separated from their practice of science? So this question was uh, to Professor Nanda and Dr. Rajima. Professor Nanda, would you like to respond? Professor Nanda, would you like to respond? Okay, then let me put the next question also so that when she comes on, she can respond. Uh, Shuvaji Sen says, every speaker seemed to suggest that we should fight and we should defend. But can the discussion also steer to what tangible measures can we take, either from the existing legal system or a rule or law that we should fight for in the misuse or misappropriation uh, okay. of science? In creator God? Uh, or any kind of act. Um, so, uh, yes, thanks. Uh, yes, Mira, you're speaking. Can you carry on? Professor Nanda, you are, you're telling something. Can you carry on? No. Okay, another question from Mayang Vahia. The agenda for 21st century or oh, 21st century agenda for science, Indian science, is to Indianize science. Show that it is an Indian tradition as much as Western enterprise. So that's that's a comment from Mayank. Uh, if the panelists want to, to comment on that, they may. Uh, Prajwar Shastri says, I'm just reading out the questions first because now we'll not have much time to, to take each question to different speakers. Uh, Prajwar Shastri says, what steps should be carried out to bring Muslims to higher education with their poor econo socio-economic background? Actually, that was a question from Urma Ansari. Okay. Yeah, but you have put me so I, I, I thought it was from you. But anyway, whoever it is, the question is there. Rajiguru says, in the same way as TJ in an earlier meeting proposed a social justice committee, I think it should also address the non-secular religious practices at academic workplaces. Uh, so oh, well, I have read out the questions that have come. There will be more questions coming, but we don't have much time. So if can anybody I, wants to take this question, yeah. please go ahead. Can I, can I answer the first one? 
Yes, uh, it's about Muslims um, to be encouraged to uh, do the higher education. I think the uh, this uh, the reasons that are known to us that Muslims drop out rate is so high. Muslims are so few in higher education. The reason is um, economic. Unless there is a um, an economic prosperity, if people can afford higher education, the cost of higher education is very high for most of the people. I mean, Muslims want to study, as you see, the numbers are that they enrolled in school. However, they are unable to carry on forward. It's because of the, mostly because of the economic factor. And as somebody very rightly pointed out, I mean, this is a blame that Muslims send, want to send their children, not to secular school, but to only madrasas, which is 4%. And even madrasas, I mean, I have experience of madrasas, you know. Aligarh University runs a program where madrasa teachers come and they are trained and refresher courses are being run to train them for science and mathematics and other um, uh, disciplines. And we know that, I mean, these people are probably, I mean, I would say that most of the students that go to these madarsas, they make them really backward only, not communal. That is one thing. But I mean, unless you have secular schools, enough of them near the neighborhood and encourage parents to send their children to school and give scholarship to students from the economically weaker sections so that they can come up and choose the choose among them the Baraja ones to support for higher education also. I think yeah that is thank you. Thank you. Uh, now uh, we have to come to a close. But uh, Anita, but Mayang Bhaiya wanted to say something regarding this issue of Indianization of science. And I would request him to unmute himself and, and say. But in brief, very brief. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to say that the problem is that Indian education science is seen as a Western enterprise that challenges and unnecessarily questions Western tradition. And to undo that, we have to show that science is an Indian enterprise. It is not an important enterprise. And it is surprisingly easy to do because if you look at the ancient uh, secular books like Vaisheshika, etc., they are so classically scientific that if you highlight the fact that Indian science has been, um, I mean, the, for example, definition of uh, what is knowledge, etc., are so scientific that one, can, one just needs to show those books to the people concerned that look, Indian scientific traditions are as old as Indian uh, knowledge itself. And if you only until you change that narrative, science will always be seen as a Western enterprise and a threat to India's traditions, and therefore you there will always be a hostile reception of this one. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll now need to close this this discussion. It has been a very uh, lively discussion. Various things we learned, various perspectives we could be exposed to, uh, and uh, to just take uh, Mayan's last comment. Yes, India did have a very uh, lively tradition of science, especially astronomy and mathematics, medical science, in various areas. India did contribute a lot, but unfortunately, that is not what we are proud of. We are being told to proud of certain imaginary uh, glory of ancient India, that Indian sages used to fly on aircraft, Indian uh, uh, Medical practitioners could put an elephant's head on a human torso. <laughs> uh, the the, the San Sanjay giving a the running commentary to uh, of the Mahabharata war essentially means there was internet and television and all these. See, this is what is being fed to the Indian populace as the the history of India. Now, this is what the scientific community has to break. We have to tell the people. That yes, we had a very strong scientific tradition, which we have lost, lost due to religious prejudices, due to various uh, uh, problems that came in the way of science in India. For example, Acharya Pesire has pointed out three important factors for the death of science in India. The prime one he pointed out is casteism, something 
that makes the doer and the thinker separate. And in that condition, science cannot flourish. He also pointed out the Shastras, which said you can do this, you cannot do that. And finally, the whole practice of medical science died off because the teacher could not teach the student by, by dissecting a cadaver. And finally, he also pointed out uh, uh, towards the, the idea of Vedanta, which said that the material world is Maya. It is illusion. <laughs> look away from the material world and look into something else. And when that idea took root in the Indian intelligentsia, that created a condition where science cannot flourish. So these happened. But before that, it was a very fertile time for Indian science. And we have to tell people that, yes, that is our tradition. And that is what we have to uphold. Uh, today's discussion was very uh, enchanting. Various things we learned, but various questions also remained unanswered. And uh, the, the proper perspective of a panel discussion should be to raise question so that it's not always necessary to answer all questions. If proper, correct questions are raised in people's mind, that is also a mark of success for a panel discussion. With that, I would like to uh, call it a day. Today's discussion was very successful. I'll thank all the speakers. I'll thank all the listeners. And most importantly, I'll thank the organizers. And I request Aniket to take over and finish the discussion today. Thank you, Professor Banerjee. Uh, I just want to uh, announce, make an announcement for the uh, next week's session. Uh, you can see the seed on screen. Uh, next week, we will be uh, focusing on uh, representation of ethnic uh, minorities and tri various uh, tribal per citizens of India. And our, you can see the panel the panelist names. Uh, we would also like to thank uh, Manoj Purvankar. As you know, first couple of sessions, uh, we were for most we, we were only relying on uh, this, uh, Google Meet. But Manoj has arranged uh, these uh, Zoom meetings for us, which uh, which has uh, given us much better audio and video quality. So thank you, Manoj, for that. Uh, so uh, let's meet next week. Th thank you all for joining. OK, thank you all. Let's finish the session. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Okay.